Wonderful. All right. So I'm just going to get started. There may be that some other people, you know, come in and, and out. I'm going to try to get through this relatively quickly because our main goal is to be able to answer answer your questions here. Um, but we have a few things we'd like to tell you about the program, who we are, and those sorts of things. Um, so uh, we're going to introduce ourselves in a little more depth soon, but um, I'm Dave Kurt Howry. I'm the chair of the program. You, wanna, you guys want to say hi? I'm Michael Renner. I'm one of the professors in the program. Uh, hi, Keith Somerville. I'm one of the professors in the program. And hi, I'm Peter Levi, a new uh, assistant professor in the program. Wonderful. All right, so uh, our goal in the program is to give you as much of an immersive experience as possible uh, and to give you an interdisciplinary experience. So the idea is that, you know, environmental science is the study of, of how humans and the environment interact. And so you're going to be learning about science, policy, economics, ecology, conservation, and so on. Um, and and we're going to try to get you as much as possible out into the field to learn about it, into uh, you know some of the uh, some of the countries that we work in, um, uh, into the lab, and and so on. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there'll be research opportunities, uh, opportunities to to study in the forest. Yes, you can burn prairies and um, uh, and change the world. So. Um, uh, we, we, we do try to emphasize doing or knowing, right? So the idea is that, that if you, we just tell you something, then, uh, then you know, you're going to probably forget it relatively quickly. So the goal is to get, your, get you doing hands-on work so that when you uh, go to get a job or start your career, uh, you know what you're doing because you've done it, you've done it before. Um, we're going to try to help you understand the connections between people and the environment and uh, Give you give you a good uh, sense of how the social and natural sciences um, interact. Uh, so I'm going to tell you briefly about the the curricula. And so first we have the our science major, and our science majors have have two sections, right? So there are I'm sorry two tracks. So there's the conservation biology track and a hydrology geology track. So uh, all of our classes, oh, sorry, all of our majors have the same core. So the core is an introduction to environmental science. It's um, a case analysis class where you're going to learn about, uh, we're, we're going to be learning about things like how to, how, how to think about complex issues, how to, how to work with various state, stakeholders and, and so on. There's a geology class, a sociology class, and then an introduction to GIS. GIS is a, um, it's a, program that that we find is really useful in, in getting our graduates jobs uh, it's 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 working with maps uh, and helps you to I to, to work with spatial data essentially uh, on the computer then the uh, the conservation science uh, track has uh, a set we do a life science cluster where you're going to be working with uh, on things like ecology and and so on there's a data analysis section so that you were taking courses on how do you how do you work with complex data how do you um uh you know take what you're learning in the field and and analyze it uh, a number of field electives where you'll be out we have a um i, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later on but we have a um uh, a field site out in um, Mitchellville, which is about 20 minutes away. And so uh, we have a lot of opportunities to, to take classes there, especially during the J term. Uh, also take classes uh, where you will get you into various prairies and, and other uh, habitat around, around here. All of our uh, majors also have a science and policy integration piece where we're taking classes that, that combine um, well, the science and the policy, right? So the idea is any environmental issue ha has to start with a deep, or addressing any environmental issue has to start with a deep understanding of the science because they're all uh, at, at, at base science questions, but you can't solve environmental issues. You can't address environmental issues without uh, understanding how the policy, uh, you know, what, what the relevant policy is, what the relevant uh, levers are for making changes and so on. 
And then um, if you're doing the Bachelor of Science, then you're going to be presenting a, a, a research thesis uh, based on the, the research that you've done during your time here. Uh, that, that includes a presentation. And then you're also going to be um, doing a capstone. So there's a, there's a capstone class that we'll tell you a little bit more about uh, later on. So anyway, the hydrology geology track is similar in a lot of ways, but you can see the, uh, the, the yellow sections are different. There's now a physical science cluster where you're going to be learning chemistry, hydrology, those kind of things. Um, uh, you'll need some quantitative background. So you'd be in the, in the uh, you'd be taking calculus uh, through, through Calc 2 and some other things like that. Um, you will also be, have an opportunity here to uh, develop an area of specialization. Right, so some of you may be more interested in sort of chemical analysis. Some of you may be more interested in physical hydrology, those kind of things. Uh, so we want to give you an opportunity to kind of build your your um, uh, major and kind of build what you uh, are going to get out of that. Then uh, again, science policy integration and the other pieces. So that's that's one of the science major. The other major we have is currently environmental policy. Um, but I want to tell you, I'm going to briefly talk about the environmental policy, but my guess is that by the time you come to Drake, uh, it's going to be a sustainability major. So we, we've uh, been proposing this change, and it will be, we expect it to be approved on Monday. Um, so anyway, so, so essentially the, the uh, way the policy curriculum is set up right now is that you have the core and the science policy integration and capstone. Um, but there's also four different areas where uh, you'll be getting some, some expertise. There's economic, historical, social, and political. What we've done with the um, sustainability major uh, is we have um, uh, added, well, we, we, we realized that uh, environmental policy uh, a lot of when people see that name, they often think that that it means that we're you're, you're being trained to work in the government, right? And that's that's not actually our goal. Our goal is to train people who can think about systems in a in a holistic and integrative way, and who can uh, uh, work who, who can build sustainable sustainability solutions, right? So we the 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 sustainability and resilience major. Um, is organized like the others around around the core the science policy integration but then also gives you that there, there's a junior level uh sustainability class where you're going to be you're going to be actually engage, doing uh sustainability analysis for the university and learning how to do that so that when you want to go do that in your career you, you you've had that experience but also and you can also get the, the benefit of knowing that you know you you've helped to make the University more sustainable, uh, and then uh, we we try to again build that build the the major around giving you an opportunity to um, uh, get to to to, um, to uh, personalize your your experience. So essentially, the the sustainability major has uh, four outcomes, and you need to take a set of classes that, that, that meet each of those outcomes. So anyway, we will certainly get you some information about that if you're interested as soon as that gets, uh, gets passed. So I want to now take just a minute to introduce you to who we are. Um, and I am, uh, David Crowd Howery. Uh, my PhD is from Stanford in chemistry, uh, and I am the chair of the NSP. Uh, I actually, even though my, my PhD is in chemistry, I have since sort of moved much more in the direction of uh, ecological economics and some of science and policy integration. Uh, so I teach our intro to environmental science. I teach our climate class, which is one of those science and policy integration classes. Uh, we, I do a lot of modeling. So we teach, our, teach the modeling class and our ecological economics class. Um, and then my research, for those of you who are interested in do, doing research, uh, I, I uh, work with students on ecological economic questions. We do some agent-based modeling uh, and, and that sort of thing. I also have recently started doing some survey-based work that ties in with some of the ecological economic questions. So anyway, so that's who I am. And next <coughs> is uh, Dr. Levi. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so my name's Peter Levi. And uh, as the slide suggests, I did my PhD at the University of Notre Dame. 
Um, and I'll be largely in charge of the physical sciences, the geology, hydrology track. So as you can see, uh, the courses I'll be teaching include principles of geology, uh, different water resources related courses. Um, and the research I do is related to nutrient dynamics, uh, such as nitrogen and phosphorus in stream and river ecosystems. Um, and then what's really unique about being in Iowa, and especially at Drake, um, right in the capital city of Des Moines, is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, with my research to look at water quality issues in the area, and then also restorations, both in agricultural landscapes as well as in the urban landscapes. And I see that uh, those of you that are joining us tonight are from some areas that have really dealt with a lot of water stress the last uh, few months. Um, Jarvis being down in Houston, I know you had a lot of flooding. Um, and then I saw Denver, somebody's from Denver. So you obviously know um, how different water issues that are affecting the West. Uh, and then the rest of you from suburbs or large cities, um, of course, where uh, uh, water issues are very pertinent to those locations too. So um, as the person leading that physical sciences uh, track, I also wanted to just briefly say that um, that track will involve these broader questions of, uh, you know, how do humans interact with the physical environment? Um, so it's not just the physical science itself, but also, uh, you know, these issues of major flooding, drought stress, um, human uh, uh, ecosystem interactions in urban and agricultural areas. Um, so really a broad picture of um, how hydrology and water resources affect our daily lives as well as um, uh, ecological and environmental issues. I guess that ends the floor to me. I'm Michael Renner. Um, I got my doctoral degree a really long time ago in California. Um, I'm jointly appointed. I'm in biology, psychology, and environmental science. Um, the courses that I teach are essentially centered around animal behavior and animal cognition. Um, so I teach primatology, animal behavior. Uh, there's a primate cognition course that I teach every couple of years. And we develop partnerships with both the, the zoo that is about 15 minutes from campus and with a bonobo research center that is about 25 minutes from campus. And uh, we're, we're doing a lot of field-based courses and a lot of internship kinds of things that I'll talk about a little bit later there. My research is in animal cognition very broadly. Um, I, I've been working for the last several years in Rwanda at a new national park, um, the, the conflict between the chimpanzees who live in the park and the people who live around it, um, trying to figure out what's going on and what we can do about it. I also work on the captive management of endangered species. So we work with, uh, we've got projects going on right now with, with giraffes and rhinoceroses and uh, several other species of animals at the local zoo. Uh, hi, uh, Keith Somerville again. Um, I got my PhD from Miami, Ohio uh, in 2001. I'm currently serving as interim dean for the College of Arts and Sciences, so that's taking me out of the classroom and out of the field a little bit. Uh, my time as, as serving as, as dean is up in June or July of this summer, so then I'll return back to the program full time. Uh, my, 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 my background is in animal conservation biology. I work on both invertebrate animals and vertebrate mammals. I teach classes in mammalogy, invertebrate zoology, entomology, conservation biology, and restoration ecology. I, you know, in essence, most of what I do is actually outdoor, hands-on field work. Um, so I can promise that, that you will have opportunities to handle animals and be, you know, sort of intimately involved in the design of uh, conservation projects uh, that involve animal species, not just in the state of Iowa, but I also have project sites in, in Rwanda in a collaboration with Dr. Renner. And I do a lot of work in, in southern Indiana in forested uh, mountain systems. So we're going to talk briefly about some of the field classes. Uh, one of the things that we do here that we think is pretty cool is uh, our, sci our seniors have uh, the senior capstone and the way it, instead of just sort of you know writing a report or coming up with a with a paper or something for the capstone what we do is we work with external stakeholders uh, who come to drake and say you know we need something right uh, and what we do is we get the students working in groups to work on that thing and to provide the state the stakeholders with um with with something and also at the same time you know again improve the you know 
improve the Des Moines area, come up with um, some, some neat hands-on experience. One of the things that we did in uh, Senior Capstone was uh, students wrote a grant for a garden here called the, the Sprout Garden. Um, and they actually won a $45,000 grant, so it's an expensive garden, but, uh, but it's very nice. Um, and, and that was, the, there were a number of things, reasons why we did that. One was because it gave students uh, grant writing experience, which is something that is actually really valuable when you're uh, you know, looking for a job. It's something that very few undergraduates do, and so we thought that was a neat opportunity. Um, but it also, it also helped us to build something that, that connects Drake with the, with the neighborhood. Um, and so it's a, it's a garden where the students work with, with kids uh, from, from the area, so Boys and Girls Club um, and some other, some other groups, they come and there's, we have a, we have a, curricula, the, a curriculum that we work on with those kids. So the kids learn, you know, they, a lot of them, uh, I mean, I was amazed when we did this tree planting uh, that, that, that how many of them had never seen worms, right? So they, you know, they were digging through the trees and they found worms in the ground and they were, they were thrilled. And we think that was a, uh, well, I think it's terrible that there are kids who, who haven't played with worms yet, but um, I think that that was a really neat uh, thing that we've, we've kind of added for the students. Anyway, so the, the picture here is a tree planting for the Sprout Garden. Um, and, and every year we have a, an ENSP student who is uh, in charge of, of that, you know, of, of making sure that, uh, you know, the garden gets used and how, how the kids, how the kids uh, interact with it and so on. Okay, I'm going to take over and kind of walk you through slides that, that I want you to, as you, as you hear me speaking about them and as you look at the images, I want you to imagine yourself in the pictures rather than the students that are currently there. So this is what your, your life for four years at Drake University as an environmental science major is going to look like. Uh, here's some students that are in a field ecology uh, class um, associated with our, our One Earth Laboratory. It's kind of our foundational um, uh, environmental science experience that you all will have in the fall of 2016. Uh, they're sampling macroinvertebrates uh, in Rock Creek to try to uh, determine whether or not this, this system should be on the Iowa impaired waters list. Uh, this image here is, is a project that was funded by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. These are some students uh, that are building an insect collection uh, at Chichaco Bottoms Greenbelt in, in 2012. And they're doing this uh, to uh, try to get a better understanding. You see the cornfield in the upper uh, left-hand corner of the, of the image. They're doing this work to try to get a sense for how agricultural systems impact uh, native biodiversity in non-crop land uses. So they're all uh, collecting insects to again try to get a sense for whether or not this system is negatively or perhaps positively impacted by land uses in, in the surrounding area. Uh, here I am, um, certainly not dressed like I am right now. Um, I actually much prefer uh, what you see in the picture there. This is uh, a, a class of mine doing bird banding on migratory oblers and other species out at our, our environmental learning center. So again, hands-on, what you're seeing here is me actually doing the demonstration. Uh, you know, five minutes after this picture was, was taken, we, we, we worked uh, kind of very closely with these students to give them all experience handling birds, uh, putting bands on the birds and recording standard ornithological data uh, for uh, the National Audubon Society. Uh, this is a, a project with a similar group of students and we're uh, inside the classroom at our Environmental Learning Center. This is where I teach out of most of my classes at Drake begin with a little bit of instruction and then loading students up and traveling to field destinations so that you learn again by doing. Uh, and here we are talking about collections management and how to record data in a standard way. Uh, this is us lighting stuff on fire uh, at, uh, uh, I think this is Sailorville in one of the Savannah restoration sites that I've received money uh, to study. Um, fire is used as a disturbance in these systems to try to remove invasive species and promote uh, overall health in the landscape. And so students are involved in managing uh, some of these burns. Um, we have coursework that we offer that will allow you to get your yellow card, which essentially makes you burn certified in the state of Iowa. Um, so one of the, again, you know, giving you a skill that you're not gonna get at very many other institutions. These are introductory students, advanced students. <laughs> to turn around. Uh, I will teach uh, students how to handle uh, mammal, uh, 
mammal behavior and, and mammal conservation. Here we are working with a population of voles out at uh, Sand Hill Prairie just uh, this past year. Um, represent probably students' most favorite groups of things to work on for undergraduate research projects. And so over the few years, I've had students working on bobcat conservation, uh, coyote management, small mammal inventory, and, and reproductive behavior in managed and unmanaged systems. Uh, and and it, that seems to be something that, that students really gravitate towards. Uh, these are uh, two of my students setting Blanding's turtle traps out at the Environmental Learning Center. Blanding's turtle is a state-threatened, uh, really cool turtle, um, and so you can catch them. And, and this is students doing the same thing, but for really cool fish, uh, and they're catching them. And this is, um, it, my, my work uh, moving forward is increasingly reliant on remote sensing. So I'm working very hard to get the money necessary to purchase some drones that we can use to do some remote sensing applications. We taught a first drone-based course uh, this spring as a collaboration with a former student, Andrew Rupiper. Uh, I see a lot of value in, in talking about and bringing in remote sensing into the classroom because it is a tool to help you understand the larger landscape. The picture that you saw a few slides ago with the little mammal in the glove, that's a very localized phenomenon. The life of that little mammal in the glove is really impacted by what you see on all these colors in this map. It's not just a local pattern or process. Mammal biodiversity is really structured by higher level things that are happening at, at regional or state scale. Michael, we can't hear you. Michael. I can't hear anything. Uh, I hear now? Why don't you, you, you use it, I'll turn mine on. All right. Can everybody hear me now? I can hear you the now. The monkeys! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, can you hear me? OK, there we go. All right, so students can do a practicum at ACCI, which is what we call it, or the APE initiative. And the, the practicum is essentially learning how to function in a place. Uh, the, these animals have a 50-year lifespan, and so you have to give them a really good environment. Uh, and uh, th there are all kinds of procedures and rules, and you know, it's still they, they are incredibly intelligent, and you still interact with them um, as if they are wild animals, because they are. Um, one of the residents out there is Kanzi, who is a, a very famous bonobo. He has been documented 20 years ago when he was actually very young. To, to have full comprehension of about 3,000 spoken English words. Um, you can speak a sentence to him that he has never heard before that has really complicated instructions in it, and he gets it. Um, once you've been there for a while, then you can start moving into an internship experience and, and then on into independent research. Um, it is a very closely controlled environment, so we are the only institution that has students out there at this point. Um, and then that's something that would be very unique if you were to come to Drake. I also teach a course in zoo biology, which is one of our field courses. Um, we have a full partnership with the Blank Park Zoo, which is an accredited zoo that is about 15 minutes from our campus. Um, students do projects where they are both out in the public space at the zoo and back behind the scenes. Um, in this case, the, uh, one of the, the area supervisors in charge of the carnivores, uh, who is one of our best partners out there, is showing us how they work with uh, Deuce, who is their five-year-old male lion, um, to do basic behavior training so that, that he has some control over his environment so that he can participate in his own care, so that he has more things to do. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an experience to be within a couple feet of this as well as just the mesh between you. It's completely safe, but uh, students find it to be very powerful. And that's Barnaby. Barnaby is my buddy. Um, but Barnaby is the oldest living vertebrate in Iowa. He is an Aldabra tortoise. Um, he is, at one point when the zoo was operated very differently a long time ago. Um, people were given rides on Barnaby. You don't do that anymore. Um, but he, he is trained to do a, a wide variety of behaviors. Again, he participates in his own care. Um, he can express his preferences. Uh, he, he can do things that just help him be managed and be happier. Uh, there's a custom-built uh, house for Barnaby and his family and an outdoor area that they can go out into the permits. 
think we skipped one. There we go. Um, th this is, that's Keanu. Uh, the, the zoo recently acquired two very young uh, northern black rhinoceri, except they're actually called rhinoceroses, which I learned recently. Um, the black rhinoceros is an endangered species. Um, they have lost about 90% of their population in the wild in the last 20 years. And we fully expect that the only viable population in the world within the next 50 years will probably be captive. So the zoo community is working very hard to, to understand them, to be able to take good care of them and give them good lives. And part of that is, is learning to habituate them to being in contact with humans, obviously in a protected way. Um, but this is one of our students in the zoo biology class essentially helping Keanu get used to being touched by humans and to understand what the signals mean. And sometimes they watch us. Um, this is one of our students. Uh, I, I happened to be there at the moment that he realized that it wasn't one-way glass. Um, and that the tiger was watching him just as much as he was watching her. Um, that's uh, Misha. She's a three-year-old. Um, she's the one tiger we have now. She will have a mate soon. We are working with the, the tiger program to, to bring a male tiger. And then eventually, we hope there will be tiger cubs at the zoo. And there will be all kinds of studies to do then. All right, so now we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the re oh. So now we've got some of the research opportunities. Sorry, I'm just uh, uh, technologically challenged, apparently. Uh, some of the research opportunities that you have here. Keith, I think that's you. So um, as Dave mentioned, we was talking about the, the curriculum in the program. I think one of the most important and distinctive things about the environmental science major at Drake is that you will you will learn across all four years by doing so in any given year including um this year even though i'm serving in the role of being uh, i employ uh six or seven research interns that are, are doing a variety of things in in my laboratory and, and everyone that's listening if you're interested in doing animal stuff if you're interested in doing outdoor conservation restoration or wildlife work please come visit so that you get an opportunity to shadow some of my students working you know in the field and that you get a kind of a snapshot of what a day in the life of, of a research student is likely to be. Uh, I work very closely with you. Uh, it'll be one-on-one, -on -one, one on two, one on three. I use a peer mentoring model in my lab so that usually in a given year, there's two or three senior leads or junior leads that are kind of managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the lab. And then I start working with people either summer before they enroll at Drake. So for those of you that are interested in doing the kind of stuff that I do, I'd love to get you out and working. Uh, on projects. Peter doesn't know this yet, but our, our grant, Peter, yay, was funded. Um, so I've got money to do to do work on at Chichaco Bottoms again this summer, and I will be looking uh, for research internships uh, in May or June of 2016. Uh, we use mark release recapture methods to study movement in turtles. Uh, we use uh, trail cam, other uh, visual uh, sampling techniques to study river otter behavior. Uh, we do uh, some uh, restoration work uh, using remote cameras to investigate whether snakes are using hibernacula that we constructed into a restored prairie. So we basically created a mini cave and rather than sticking my head in there, which I'm not going to do, um, we use fiber optic cables to look at whether or not bull snakes and other uh, fairly large uh, reptiles are using this, this, this sort of man-made or, or human-created structure to encourage hibernation. So now we play. And that's Ruhira. Um, Ruhira lives in Rwanda. Um, he's one of the chimpanzees at the Gishwadi National Park, which until about four months ago was the Gish Gishwadi Forest Reserve. Um, this is where I do research. And uh, every year, the last five years, I've actually been able to take students with me to this, this site. Um, we have a number of projects going on there. Um, this is the project that Dr. Merville mentioned to you that we are doing in collaboration. Um, looking at different methodologies for um, propagating the ficus plant, which is known as the fig. Uh, figs are actually one of the fallback foods for chimpanzees. And so in an area where food is scarce, um, that's one that they will go to when they can't find other things that they might prefer more. And as this new national park is kind of settled into place and they acquire land around it so that it can expand its size, they need that forest to grow back. But the animals won't use it till there's food there. And so we are testing different ways to get their food crops to grow more quickly so that the, the, the land can start to be used by the population of chimpanzees, which we know is growing at a fairly rapid rate and is going to outgrow the reserve if we're not kind of careful with it. So the way that we do that is, um, and actually the, the J-term class that I'm taking there in less than a month um, will be planting more ficus, um, but they plant uh, branch cuttings, essentially very simple 
procedure to, to put branch cuttings into the ground and soil and some water. And then uh, th this is one of our recent graduates who is uh, measuring the vitality of that plant a couple of years later. You know, the height of the plant, how many leaves does it have, the, the standard measurements that you use to see whether the plant has, has caught on and is doing well. Um, that student has actually just finished her master's degree in primate conservation in England and is moving on to a PhD, PhD program starting next month. And one of the adventures you get to have if you go to Rwanda is that um, you may be the only white person they have seen um, in many months. And so it's always kind of a big show when you show up because the, the teachers might let the students out of, out of class to come meet you. Um, so th there's always kind of a big hullabaloo and it's very exciting and it, it, it's, it's a lot of fun because everybody is very excited about this. Um, this is another group of students uh, working in the reserve in 2012. Um, we had just started at that point developing a new model to, to try to explain why the chimpanzees would actually come out of the reserve and raid the agricultural crops rather than staying in and eating the natural products. In 2014, we went back uh, because the model we developed worked essentially perfectly to predict where the chimpanzees would and wouldn't raid the crops. And the government asked us to come back and map the entire entire edge of the reserve so that we could apply this methodology on a much larger scale. And so we spent quite a bit of time there um, essentially taking the measurements so that we could build these GIS maps uh, to, to make the predictions that we made. And it's not here in the slides, but I can tell you that the, the model continues to work on a much larger scale. So uh, they, they are asking us back to do more projects and provides all kinds of opportunities for Drake students who want to be doing you know, human-animal interface work in, in preserved settings. We're also involved with a nonprofit organization in Rwanda that is doing, in addition to the research and conservation work, uh, developing the communities around this new national park so that the people will have a sustainable livelihood. Um, this is the Kavukaro Craft Cooperative, um, which is, uh, was originally sponsored by the Forest of Hope Association, our partners there. Um, it is now a self-sustaining entity, uh, which has created jobs for, for the women who use the natural products from the forest in a way that's sustainable and doesn't damage the habitat. And we always uh, take books and soccer balls to the local schools when we go. Um, the, the children there do with, with very little. And so even a couple of extra books or a new soccer ball is, is a big deal. And uh, it, it's a good way to build community. It's a good way to, to make clear that, that you know, we, are, we are there for good reasons and that uh, we, want to, well, we want to be a positive influence in the community. And the students who've been part of this have always just remembered that as much as they remembered anything else from the whole trip. All right, and the other thing, one other thing we want to talk a little bit about. You're working in places where you may not have imagined going. Um, so first of all, we have a number of study abroad programs, or Drake has, sorry, Drake has a number of partners um, uh, with some study abroad programs. So we have a lot of students right now, who, 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 I'm sorry, we have a lot of students who will travel abroad, uh, take, a, take a semester abroad. Um, right now we have, let's see, a student in Australia. Um, I think there's one down in Costa Rica. We recently had students uh, travel to and, and study in um, uh, in Argentina and Ecuador and some other some other places all around all around the world. We have some a couple of students who just applied for a grant to do some um, some quality uh, testing and improvement in Uganda, for example. Um, so uh, we will go quickly through some of these. Um, Michael, is this yours? Is uh, this student who spent uh, a semester in South Africa in the fall of 2014? She's just going to be finishing up her degree this spring now. Um, and while she was there, she was able to visit uh, essentially a big cat orphanage where animals that were either injured in the wild and couldn't survive, or that had been orphaned by poachers, uh, were brought into this facility and and reared with the eventual in intent, when possible, of releasing them back into the wild. Is one of our students who spent the fall in, of 2014 in Nicaragua. But I want to just talk for a minute about one of our partners because it's particularly well suited to environmental science students. Um, we are an academic affiliate of the School for Field Studies, which is an accredited institution. They're affiliated with the University of Minnesota. Um, and they have research sites at eight places around the world uh, that are set up to accommodate groups of up to about 20 students who come for a semester to study there. And when you go to these places, you take a full set of academic courses. Uh, there will usually be a course in the culture and language of the area that you're in. There will be environmental science courses that are relevant to the ecosystem that you're in. Um, we've already worked out how all those credits transfer back. And because we are affiliated with them, and because I'm on the academic advisory committee of this group, 
Um, uh, your some of your great financial aid goes with you if you go these places. Um, this has turned out to be a terrific experience for the, the Drake students who've done it. Uh, they have sites in, in Africa and Tanzania. There's a, a site in the Turks and Caicos Islands where they study marine ecosystems. Um, I actually visited that years ago, and it's it's pretty amazing there. Um, Peru, Costa Rica. Uh, they have a new program in Bhutan, which is a, a really interesting social development place because of, of the, the way the government has chosen on things there, and they are trying experiments about human happiness rather than economic products. Uh, so that provides a very different context for things. Uh, there, there are sites in Panama. Uh, there's an opportunity to go to Australia and New Zealand. Um, this is an opportunity to be immersed in church in a way that you will get academic credit and get to, to travel internationally. Uh, the last month that you spend at each of these places, um, by the time you're, you've been there in three months, you now know a little about the ecosystem, you know what research they're doing there, and the last month you're there, you know a research project under the supervision of the resident faculty. So it's, it's a pretty terrific experience, and, and it's very, very well done. We also have some January term seminar, travel seminars, so, uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, we also have travel seminars in January, so I think you, you probably all know that Drake has a J term, which allows us to have a, uh, Three week long uh, sort of immersive opportunity. So we do some things here at, at, at Drake, but we also we also travel. So for example, uh, last couple of years I've taken students to uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos. And uh, anyway, so I've, I've I've been taking students to Ecuador and the Galapagos, and so we have been doing some uh, some habitat restoration on the island of San Cristobal. In, in the Galapagos, and it's kind of cool to be able to go back to that every every few years and see that uh, you know some that 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 uh, as we clear the, the invasive guava and um, and blackberry from the Meconia forest, that uh, it actually has has long term impacts, and so we can go back and say, oh look, this is, this is the the section that uh, that Drake worked on you know a couple of years ago, and that's that's kind of cool. This coming year, oh actually, I guess I should probably be uh, Flipping through the uh, picture, so I guess maybe 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 Galapagos and, and Ecuador was coming up. I'll let Michael take this over. We also have some. There we go. There's my microphone. Um, for the first time this this coming year, actually in about four weeks, um, I am leaving with a group of students to go study in Rwanda for a month. Um, the, the the topic of the course is ecotourism and development in post genocide Rwanda. You may not remember the story of Rwanda, um, but in 1994, there was essentially the worst genocide that happened on the planet uh, in terms of the size of the population and the number of people who were affected by it. And the 20 years that have passed since then have been truly an amazing story. Um, one thing that will probably give your parents some comfort is that Africa is unimaginably large. The United States would fit comfortably into the upper left-hand corner of Africa. And so when you know people say, here you're going to Africa, they worry about Ebola and things like that. And the nearest Ebola case in Africa was 4,000 miles from where we work in Rwanda. That's about the same distance as Orlando to Anchorage. And so it, it's, there's a pretty safe buffer zone. The idea behind the course is that Rwanda has an integrated national sustainability plan where they are interested in using ecotourism as an economic engine. They don't have natural resources to export. Um, it's a very poor country but they have natural resources that people might want to come and see in places, in ways that you could, can't see them anywhere else. Um, there are four national parks. They are each distinct. Each is run according to a different business model, and each of them plays a different role in that national plan. And so it gives us the opportunity to, to really dig in and see how you develop an ecotourism industry where you've got these amazing natural resources in an area that's just desperately poor, and doing that in a way that's respectful of the local population and still lets people from other places in the world come see the place. So here are some pictures I took in Akagura National Park when I was there about a year and a half ago. Um, that, that's the classic Savannah Park. That is, um, if you saw the Lion King, you've seen what that kind of a habitat is like. Uh, you know, trees, grasslands, lakes, there are hippopotamuses there, there are crocodiles and elephants and zebra. Uh, there are lions. I actually saw my first leopard in the wild there on a night drive, um, which we will be doing in this, in, in this course. Um, it, Akagari is the kind of the classic what you imagine Africa to be. Um, but Rwanda is also home to, the only, to one of the only populations of mountain gorillas in the world. There are about 800 of them total in existence. Um, and Volcanoes National Park exists only because the mountain gorillas are there. And the students in this class will go see the mountain gorillas. They'll actually spend some time in, in the presence of, of a family group of mountain gorillas that are wild. 
but they've been habituated to having humans nearby so they don't take off. Um, I got to do this a couple of years ago, and it was one of the most interesting experiences of my life. Um, I took that picture with my short lens because I had a long lens with me, and they, they were too close to use it. Um, it, it was it was a very intense experience, um, very peaceful, very very calm. But my heart was still going a mile a minute the whole time because to be in the presence of these animals was 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 truly extraordinary. All right, so I was telling you about uh, Ecuador number one and um, the Galapagos. This is uh, outside of Quito, uh, Pichincha Roku, which is Roku. I'm sorry, which is um, uh, one of the mountains outside of the city, and uh, it's hard to breathe. We have tried twice to get to the top, and we keep getting thwarted by storms. But um, next time, we will we think we'll be at the top of Pichincha Roku. Um, Anyway, this is the group. Uh, we're here on Santa Cruz Island in the Galapagos. Um, there's a tortoise coming for the picture. Uh, here's we're here. We're doing some of the uh, habitat restoration work again, moving um, some of the invasive species. We do get to use machetes to do it. We don't tell Drake uh, uh, risk assessment that that's how how we're getting rid of these trees. Um, that's a joke we do. Uh, I think the dean just learned about it. All right, um, I, I think I've been muted. Thank you, I apologize for that. So uh, just briefly, uh, this is just us doing some, some restoration work in, in um, Galapagos, doing some of the, the machete work to get rid of some of the uh, trees, the invasive trees. I apologize for the sound, uh, baby sea lions. What we're doing this coming year is we're heading out to Belize, uh, to the southern part of Belize, which is by far the poorest of the uh, Belizean um, uh, areas. So, so, so we're going to the to Toledo, and uh, we're going to be looking at sustainable development. Sort of, how do you think about sustainable development when you you also you have economic uh, challenges, you have um, indigenous rights issues, and some other things. And so there's a a debt for nature swap that went on in Belize, um, and uh, and so we're going to be looking at how to how to improve that, how, how to make that that work. Um, we uh, a couple of the neat things we're going to be doing while we're there. Uh, I'm sorry, this is this is Belize, uh, so it's it's right outside of right between Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, this is one of the one of the areas near where we're going to be working. There, there's, a, there's a village here that we're going to be doing some work with. Here is uh, one of the caves that, that we do some, some of the research on. Um, there's an invasive lionfish. We're going to be spending some time trying to think about, well, how do we, how do we discourage um, uh, or how do we encourage people to eat? Uh, <laughs> I'm just looking at the uh, the comments down there. So anyway, but for my colleagues, so so we're going to be looking at how to get people to eat more lionfish because we think that may be a good way to help save the, the reef. Uh, and uh, and take your crossings. I haven't seen many of these uh, signs in the past. But anyway, so so we're looking forward to Belize. What we're going to do from now on is we're going to alternate every other year. We'll be doing Belize and the Galapagos. So <laughs> just to sum up. I apologize. I told you it was going to be short, and then we've spent the last 45 minutes talking to you. But hopefully, you guys have some questions. Um, but uh, we're going to be. I mean, our, our goal is to offer you hands-on education. We're going to learn to understand the connections between people and the environment, to engage at the roots of social and natural sciences, and to become a ready participant in the uh, in, and be able to lead decision making and so on. Um, and so now let's let's open it up to uh, questions. Uh, what do we have, uh, what kind of questions do you guys have that we can answer for you? Oh, 
uh, you can just use the chat window if you have if you have questions. Um, also, uh, if you have other things that come up, uh, please do feel free to to send us emails. Your, our, our emails are here. Uh, we one one of the things one of the ways uh, things that I think is different about Drake than uh, some of the places some of the other places you might be looking at is that we do want to be working with you and let us show you that by uh, by sending us an email and we will um, help you out. So can you tell us about the jobs uh, that people get? Keith, you want to do a little of that? Well, the last couple of years, um, our, our job placement rates have been uh, hovering between 98 and 100%. So if we're graduating cohorts right now of between 16 and 20 uh, seniors per year. So. Uh, we're pretty proud of, of, of what we've been able to do in part, in, as far as job placement. Um, for people that do the kind of things that you were seeing pictures about, there's two or three different career paths or different job routes that will be available for you. Um, certainly, a, a number of our graduates will end up working at the state or federal government level for um, divisions or departments of conservation or fish and wildlife service or forestry or fisheries programs. We've been able to put students uh, in, in pretty... Um, uh, competitive uh, and economically rewarding uh, positions in salmon restoration in, in Oregon. We've got some students that are working on river integrity and habitat assessments in uh, the Rocky Mountain areas. We've got a couple of students that are doing marine biology and sea turtle conservation down in Florida. Um, all of those would be jobs that are primarily going to be funded at the federal or state government level. Uh, we've had a, a, a number of, of students that choose to stay in the Midwest end up doing environmental consulting. And so what they're doing is they're working for a private sector company and they're hired as either ecologists or toxicologists or hydrologists uh, or environmental engineers. And they are their, their job is to go into areas that are, um, let's say, slated for redevelopment. So to take a, a place that is timber and agriculture and you're going to put a new highway interchange right on that land in order to do to do that project. The government uh, allocates money for the, the performance of an environmental impact statement, and that requires uh, individuals with, with bachelor degree training, et cetera, to, to be able to work in those capacities. We certainly have students that end up going for the Nature Conservancy or the World Wildlife Fund. Nature, we've had students have some success with. Our goal, Keith seems to have lost his internet. So, um, uh, while he's waiting to come back up, uh, from the policy side, so the, the sustainability side, uh, we definitely, we, we don't have quite as many pictures because it's, it's not as cool to, to, you know, see somebody working on the computer. Um, but we do have, uh, we, we, we have a number of students who are in, in urban planning, urban and regional planning. We have a good group of folks who, uh, you know, go into, say, um, uh, advocacy organizations, so working for, you know, we're working on, on various uh, political projects. We have people uh, who, we have a lot of students who go on and get master's degrees in, say, public affairs or um, uh, policy, law, uh, certainly a number of our students head on to get, to get PhDs in a whole range of, of fields. Stephanie just asked a question about GIS. Um, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. It's essentially one of the wave of the future kinds of things. Um, our core for all three of the programs that we talked about includes two courses in GIS. Uh, there, there's a, a basic level course that introduces you to the concepts and the technologies and teaches you how to run the software. And then a more advanced course where you actually do projects with it. Um, and something that has been very helpful to our graduates in, in finding the kinds of jobs that Keith was just talking about is that when you graduate from here, you, you will be essentially competent at mid-level GIS stuff. And a lot of students actually go further than that. They will, they will take on a thesis project or they'll work on a faculty member's project that requires them to continue using those skills. And so they will continue to build them. Um, so we, we, have actually, we have a former graduate who is teaching the GIS course for us now. Um, because he's just such a wizard at it, we can't find anybody better. And you know, we're, we're proud to have him with us, but he's, he's somebody who learned how to do that in, this, in the building that we work in. I would, I Keith would is typing quick, up an answer to Rachel, um, but okay, maybe I'm wrong. Um, basically, the difference between biology and environmental science is that, uh, that environmental science is a study of how humans and, and, and the environment interact, right? So 
in biology, you're going to be learning about ecosystems, essentially, and, and be focusing on organisms and on um, uh, natural systems in isolation. Whereas uh, in environmental science, you're going to be you're going to be focusing on how those how those interact with with people. And I guess uh, uh, Keith and Michael might have some some more to add to that. But yeah, that's I think often the way I like to think about about what makes environmental science different from a lot of the other. Uh, oh, and Peter has a job related comment. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm trying to interject from afar. So if I could just to, to Caleb and Nick, who had those concerns and maybe others do as well, um, a big advantage of being at Drake, too, is that through our courses, not only do we have these great travel seminars, but even locally, uh, Drake University is the largest university in the city of Des Moines, which is Iowa's capital. And through our courses and our research, we interact regularly with people at Iowa DNR, uh, the EPA, um, different nonprofits that are state and uh, national, um, as well as government officials. And so we really expose you to individuals who are in these different jobs all across the board. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to uh, interact with them and, and kind of see what that job path might entail um, while you're still a student, which I think is highly advantageous um, with Drake being situated in Des Moines, as I said. And that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> right, we're just scrolling through and trying to make sure that we have all of the um, uh, 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 questions here. So uh, let's see. Sorry. I think, how is biology so different asked, than um, science? As well as Jarvis's question. Keith is, Keith is, Keith is typing a response to Jarvis. Sorry, I got, Sorry, I got a look there. The, the chat window is actually pretty small, so we're trying to make sure we don't miss anybody's questions. I think Rachel Rachel asked how the biology uh, major within ENSP is different than just majoring in biology. Michael, do you want to know something else about that? I'm in a little bit of an odd position to say about that because I'm actually in both departments. Uh, the, the, the biology major, I think David got essentially hit the nail on the head with the answer. The biology program is studying how those systems work, essentially studying each system in independently of the others. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you want to be a physiologist, you really need to dive deep into physiology. Um, in environmental science, you need to take that knowledge and then solve real world problems with it. And so you have to know those things, but then you have to be able to carry it further. Um, one of the things that is intriguing to me and one of the reasons I actually ended up mostly in the environmental science program, even though my background is, is more in neuroscience than anything else, is the focus on the interaction between living things and the environment. Sometimes it's human environment interactions, sometimes it's interaction between humans and other kinds of living things like plants or animals. Um, but it, it's an additional level of complexity and that's where you find real world problems. That's where a lot of the very exciting research these days is being done. Is, is, it, is interdisciplinary areas where you have to combine some knowledge of behavior with some knowledge of you know basic biological processes with some knowledge of how big systems work. Um, the problems are messier, uh, they're more exciting, and you can find them everywhere. Caleb, um, uh, the classes you'll take as a, as a first year depend a little bit on which track you're going to be in. Uh, if you're in, say, biologi biological, well, I should say, any, any first years, unless you've AP'd out, you're going to take intro to environmental science the, the, the fall when you get here. That's going to introduce you to the field in general, give you the background knowledge that you need to succeed later on, and just kind of hopefully give you a sense of, of what, what we do. Um, so you'll take that. Then a lot of people in biological uh, area and in the, in the conservation there will take intro biology. Uh, and then you're going to work with a with with a um, oh yeah I'm sorry then you're going to work with a um, you know an advisor to figure out what other classes to take in the in the fall in the spring you're going to take again some more biology you'll take intro geology and with, with the lab there uh, and that's kind of some of the introductory courses that you'll take in in your first year if you're in in uh, the 
hydrology geology track, then you're going to be doing the same the same classes, except instead of biology, you'll probably be doing chemistry. Uh, if you are in uh, the uh, sustainability track, then you're probably going to be taking intro to environmental science and uh, probably environmental sociology, uh, or maybe some other some other classes that seem to fit for you. Certainly, some there are some students who will be taking classes like environmental psych. Which is, which is another popular one for, for first years. Uh, all of our Drake students take a first year seminar, which, which is a kind of a neat program. I imagine admissions has probably told you a little bit about the first year seminars. Um, we each have at some point uh, taught first year seminars. I think that's true. Um, uh, and, and definitely it's a, it's a neat way to get introduced to college. Other, other questions people have? And uh, Dave, Michael, Keith, me if I'm wrong, but based on Caleb's question, you don't, and kind of related to Rachel's, you don't necessarily need to select a major or a, can you not hear me? Jarvis, did, did Keith get to your question? Oh, Keith typed your question up above. Great. Other questions folks have? It's also the case correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you don't need to select your track or major your first year. So you can take courses of what you think you're interested in. Uh, do call, do, do, do send us emails or give us a call if, um, if you have questions. Uh, we would love to talk to you. If you come out to Drake, you know, one of those questions, people ask what, what kinds of things do, um, do our alums do? Uh, one thing I often like to do is is just when when uh, students are visiting, we'll just pull up the the alumni Facebook page, and you can we can scroll down and kind of get a get a real random sample of uh, all the difference that that people are doing out of out of Drake Environmental Science, and it can give you kind of a good sense of the variety of, of opportunities. Um, so we would love it if you guys can make it out here. Uh, please do set up an appointment with us, uh, and we can talk to you a little bit more if you have specific questions. <laughs> Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you about machetes. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for taking the time to, to uh, join, join us here and be in touch. please do be. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you all. Oops. Thank you. Please visit. Have a great evening, everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs>